I was interested in the spaces, the environments, once you remove the machinery and the workforce. Um, and um, I wanted to make a connection between those environments and the people that work there. So one of the things that I did was I, I researched archival images of the people that used to um, work in these spaces. And um, one of the areas that I photographed was at the Grant and Gas Works in Edinburgh. Um, this was actually an image that I received from the manager of the gas works. This was part of a cache of, of albums that he had actually uncovered at the, at the gas works, which showed the, uh, the development of the works in the early 1900s. This was one of the 10, this was a 10 by eight inch glass plate negative that he had just come across. And it was round about the time that I was down there. Um, so I scanned, and I projected this image onto the gas holder um, that, where the image was originally taken in the early 1900s. This is, um, if I can get this to work now. Oh. Oops, sorry, something's... Ah, there we go. Great. That's great. So this was actually one of the images that was part of this series called um, uh, the... Um, the scenes from the working man's past. And um, this was taken inside a gas holder down at uh, uh, Granton. This had been purged. And uh, this image that I sort of projected onto the, onto the bars of the piston uh, was from that original cache of images that, uh, that were uncovered on the site. So this was all taken in camera. This was um, shot using a a 5.4 um, plate camera. And uh, what I would do is I'd go into the environment during the day, um, uh, set it up, take an image on a sheet of film of that environment, leave the camera set up until nightfall and come in and um, project the image onto space, onto the same sheet of film. So it almost became sort of like installation art. So that was my sort of initial relationship between photography and the energy industry. So I ended up working um, freelance when I graduated from, from university for um, about 12, 13 years, but always with a, um, an interest in deindustrialization. Um, and it was for me, working commercially was always a means to an end. It was, it, I, I always sought to try and um, work in a way that allowed me to have the time to develop my own projects. That was always my, my ultimate sort of um, uh, ambition. So around right about 2013, I was getting a little bit sort of fatigued with working um, uh, commercially. Um, I, I wasn't finding that I was getting the time really to get my teeth into developing projects. Um, and so I... I decided that that's when it seemed a good time to try and work in the oil and gas industry. I identified that as essentially our last remaining heavy industry, and it hadn't been photographically documented thoroughly up until that point. So I realized that there was definitely no way I was going to just be able to get some kind of commission to go and photograph offshore. And I felt that the best way for me to do that was to work offshore. So I ended 2013, I spent a week up in Aberdeen um, doing my uh, the, the, um, offshore um, certificates, the, the, the Bosiet and MIST, which are the sort of minimum requirements for working offshore, spent a week up in Aberdeen completing them. And then about eight months really trying to sort of connect with recruitment agent, agencies, drilling contractors, facilities companies in Aberdeen, to try and get uh, the opportunity to work offshore. It's all about that industry is, is really all about who you know. So, and I didn't really know that many people and um, particularly living in Glasgow. So anyway, I had to be very resourceful. Photography is not a particularly transferable skill to the offshore industry. So, um, but I managed to get a, a fortunate break and I got a, a core crew position on a, on a drilling rig as a steward. Uh, so anyone doesn't know what a steward does offshore, you're essentially working in the galley, doing laundry, cleaning cabins, that sort of thing. 
So anyway, I, I spent my, my first experience was I had two week trip on the Janus Alpha platform, which is the sort of southeastern sector of the, the Scottish North Sea. So about 170 miles southeast of Aberdeen, I had a two week trip there. And it was really transformative for me. Um, that first experience going out on a chopper, it was a super puma. So it was like people facing each other, sitting in this quite um, compacted uh, helicopter in your survival suit, very noisy, absolutely the kind of definition of uh, tin of sardines. That's what it felt like. But actually flying out there and, you know, witnessing this kind of tangled web of piping as we approached this sort of platform and this sort of bright orange gas flare, there was really something quite surreal and post-apocalyptic. That incongruous nature, um, that collision between industry and nature, which I, I found deeply fascinating. So that was my first experience. Um, these shots I'm actually taken separately. This was uh, this was when I was doing a, a sort of further project later on, which I'll sort of come across, and likewise this. But this is just more sort of reminder for myself. So it's quite interesting. So this Janus Alpha platform, which was um, floating production and offloading vessel, so it was a semi-submersible ves uh, vessel that had huge giant pontoons to keep it sort of in place. And I remember it was really interesting because I had a cabin. Most of it, it almost felt like I was on a submarine a lot of the time. Um, very, very few windows. Um, but my cabin was in a sort of uh, a section that was quite high up on the um, on the uh, on the installation on the platform, and it was just under the gas flare, and I could feel the heat from it. I mean, it was just really unbelievably intense. So, so it was two weeks there working away, um, just finding my sea legs. And actually when I was looking through images the other day from my time there, these were just these were just snaps, these are just phone snaps. Um, I hadn't actually realized how many of these I'd taken. I just, at the end of a shift, so you work 12 hours on, 12 hours off, I had a day shift. And at the end of my day shift, I was just going up to the area where I could get out, where it was allowable for me to sort of get out and, uh, you know, get some fresh air and get a sense of my sort of bearings and the environment. So, um, so I just did this every almost every night for the sort of two week period that I was, uh, I was offshore on that platform. But this no longer exists. This platform it was decommissioned, um, and uh, dismantled. I think it might have been in Denmark or Norway. I can't remember. Um, for anyone that's interested, the platform that's in the far side there is the uh, on the right hand side. That's the Clyde platform. So that was my first trip. As I was really interested, I was working in the galley as well, and I came across this the other day, and I thought, oh, I should really show this because I remember I was working working in the galley one day, and they're just sort of cleaning the floor because I mean, you know, when you're working offshore, things have to be sort of immaculate and clean. That's your kind of job. And there was a grate on the galley floor and they said, oh yeah, just sort of sweep that uh, into there. And it was just like directly below was, was this sort of view down onto the sea directly underneath the, the platform, which was really interesting. So this is me in an ill-fitting suit, a uh, boiler suit on, on, that, uh, on that trip. So that was my sort of introduction to life offshore. This was actually Cromarty first. So this was uh, a couple of months later, in October 2014, this would be the drilling rig, the jack-up drilling rig that I would work on for two years. I had a, a contract three weeks on, three weeks off, and this was the rig that I was uh, that I was going to be working on thereafter. So, this is just a frog that's used to sort of lift people up onto the onto the platform. So, so I was on this drilling rig, um, and for me, it was really about bedding in, getting to know everyone on the platform. Uh, it had always been my intention that at some stage I needed to sort of broach the subject of photography. Um, so after about five months of getting to know everyone right across the across the rig, I mean, people, people offshore, I have to sort of emphasize that generally people want to get through a trip uh, in the most enjoyable fashion they can. So people that not are not necessarily not necessarily be your your friends onshore, offshore, 
there's really good camaraderie because it helps everyone essentially to get through a trip. So um, I got to know everyone on on the rig. Um, and then after a, a period of time, I, I, con I, I went to speak to the oil installation manager and I asked, I said, look, I'm a photographer on the outside. Do you mind if I start taking some photographs, just seascapes? So uh, I said that it was all going to be film based. So there was no need for me to get a permit to work, which was which was handy. And the manager was like, no problem at all. That's fine. So I took a series of seascapes and um, on, when I was back on shore, I printed a set out and then um, on my next trip, I brought them these prints out um, and I gave them to the, the rig manager and he was like, "This is these are great, do whatever you want. As long as you're doing your job, just do whatever you want. So so that was great. So that was my first um, um your opportunity really to properly explore um, the, the sort of territory that I was sort of working in and the people that worked there. So again, my job was, you know, as a steward, you're, you tend to spend your, your, your shifts, whether it's day shift or night shift inside. So for me, it was really important to get this sort of opportunity the, that sort of, there was a kind of almost this, sense of escape being able to the either at the end of a day or before a, a shift began to get these capture these images get this try and communicate this sense of sort of isolation um and obviously i had always been thinking about the kind of wider sort of ramifications of the oil and gas industry so, so trying to communicate that through these sort of images as well and this is something I did sort of constantly, every sort of trip I would, whether it was night shift, uh, day shift, always trying to sort of capture images of the sort of location. And there was always, there was almost a sort of meditative process to this work as well, getting out for sort of long periods, taking these sort of long exposures. So the being on a drilling rig, the fulcrum of the drilling rig is the drill floor. Okay, so this was, of course, an area that would generally be completely off limits to, to a steward. So um, again, because I felt that I had that opportunity now to explore the entire rig, um, I would speak to the, uh, um, the on-shift driller and the team and ask if I could sort of come out during, that, during times that I had breaks in my shifts and start photographing in that area. And it was really interesting, again, making this connection with archival sort of photographs when, uh, you know, photograph photography's relationship to sort of heavy industry when it first started. I wanted to, um, I wanted that to be sort of an influence in the work that I was sort of producing. Um, because there was something that was almost kind of dystopian about this sort of world. I mean, I almost sort of regarded it as being like this sort of like parallel universe where H.G. Wells meets William Gibson, where you've got something that on the surface appears to be almost from a time of sort of industrial revolution, yet the technology that's, that's, that's used to operate these huge sort of bespoke bits of machinery and kit. You've got you've got a driller in the doghouse in a in a sort of leather seat with joysticks, you know, like it's a Starship Enterprise controlling huge sort of casing and machinery. It was really, really strange, but I was so constantly drawn to this area. So anytime I could um oh it's just a wee bit of a delay there. That's fine. So anytime that I could um you know, get get out. Had a break in my in my shift. Um, I would I would go out and just and so once I'd been in the um uh, on the drill floor, I started sort of moving around different areas of the rig. And start, starting to get portraits of the crew as well.
hope everyone's seen these okay. <laughs> So, so I just can. So this was really sort of this was important sort of aspect of 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 the sort of beginnings of this project. Essentially, I mean, it was difficult because um, I had to I had to sort of um, I had to continue sort of um, working day shift. Um, um, you know, it was long, long, long hours. You, what I tended to find was night shift would be easier for me to get out onto the drill floor. I'd maybe have an hour, hour and a half in the middle of a shift in, at night that allowed me to sort of get out and um, start sort of exploring uh, the rig. But I did get into laterally, I did get in a little bit of trouble because the, 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 the facilities company I was working for were quite nervous about me freely moving around the rig even although the um the the the, um, the the drill crew and management were happy for me to do this the the company that were directly employing employing me were sort of nervous from the from the perspective of health insurance you know that i was sort of wandering about into sort of areas that um I, I really shouldn't have been but i just had to pursue this i had to make the most of the opportunities so so this was, um, and and you know I photographed as many people as as I could. Irina, who was a data engineer there, um, and people working right across the across the rig, uh, bumpers, who was uh, an assistant driller, a young guy, who basically at the end of a three week trip, his girlfriend was in New Zealand. And at the end of a three week trip, he would just be he'd just be traveling to New Zealand, which which I kind of thought was nuts. He'd, he'd be traveling to New Zealand, meeting up with his girlfriend and just going around in a camper van for like three weeks and then coming back, and flying back which was kind of preposterous in so many ways, you know. But um, I guess he, I, I sort of said, you know, always like um, getting, you know, suffering from jet lag. He said, no, because, you know, I, I come offshore, I'm working night shift for two, three weeks. So, so it was interesting. So really interesting characters. And I actually sort of recorded quite a lot of dialogue that I had with people as well. Um, because just getting, you know, getting to know them, getting to know their perspectives on the industry as well and their characters really interesting sort of characters that you you meet offshore so what happened was so so i worked on this drilling rig between 2014 and 2016 now there was uh, a collapse in the the price of oil in 2016 so one of the areas that was particularly of interest to me as well when I was working offshore there was a lot of discussions about independence uh, the independence referendum so there was all this kind of talk about well you know if Scotland became an independent country how much how much revenue we'd be able to generate um, and so it was really interesting that, that at the same time as there was a lot of discussions that were happening around that there was a lot of kind of talk about the the fact that the, the the sector within the North Sea was uh, on a steady decline essentially since the the peak of the peak of oil and gas in the North Sea is the late nineties. So it's been a sort of declining basin ever since then. Um, so there was all this kind of talk about sort of decommissioning some of the um, you know primary sort of fields like the Brent field, for example. Um, these um, uh, fields were 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 starting to mature, and platforms were starting to uh, to be decommissioned. So there was then a, a crash in uh, the oil markets. I think the, a barrel of oil dropped from one hundred and ten dollars per barrel to about I think it was twenty. Uh, 30 maybe right about that time 2016 so what that meant was there was a squeeze streamlining people were made redundant the contract for the drilling rig that i was on at the time this drilling rig prospector war one came to an end so it came to an end um sort of september um 2016 and unfortunately most of the people that i um worked with 
um, were made redundant. I was fortunate enough as a, as a steward and being linked to sort of the, the uh, facilities company, I spent a further year working, uh, working ad hoc. And that was great. So what that meant was I had no fixed contract, but it meant that like at very short notice, the company could phone me up and say, right, we need you to go to the Britannia platform for two weeks. So that was, again, from a photography point of view, was really of interest to me because it then allowed me to get a greater kind of sense of the North Sea. And it was all, for me, I was really interested in mapping this out. I wanted to know where, um, where all the uh, installations were um, and, you know, having that opportunity to move from place to place was really, really interesting. And it became an obsession, it really, really did. Um, because I guess one of the things that um, started this whole process for me was, was having children. I mean, I went offshore when my, my kids were quite young. I, couldn't, I still, to this day, can't believe that my wife let me do this. And, um, but I thought about them and I thought about the future energy industry and how it would appear to them. And I sort of had this idea of thinking, well, they're, they're, you know, this idea of like oil rigs, uh, production platforms will be something that will be in our past, you know, um, uh, despite despite what, um, you know, our, our current uh, leader is, is, is saying, um, you know, I, I, this was, it felt like it was really important to sort of document this. And um, and also acknowledge the incredible feats of engineering that went behind sort of creating these installations and, uh, you know, uh, building these and sort of having these sort of exist in really inhospitable conditions, you know, from the sort of mid 70s onwards. So, I, of course, when I was working at hoc, I didn't get that much of an opportunity to to take my gear out, unfortunately, because I didn't really know, uh, I, I didn't, there just wasn't the opportunity, but this was one shot that I went, that I took of the uh, Alba North platform um, from the from the Britannia platform in this uh, central North Sea. So th this is, uh, these are photographs that I took when I was working on a drilling rig of the um, Javier Commander platform supply vessel. So um, what happened was when the, so when, once I'd spent a year working ad hoc, I decided that uh, I, I needed to sort of move away from, from working out in the industry. Um, I started, um, just the timing worked out, I started uh, lecturing in photography in Glasgow. And so I used, I started to use my holiday times to concentrate on a different aspect of the, of the oil and gas industry. So I started this project called Ask the Sea, and it was looking at the, um, the industry from the perspective of the platform supply vessels. So I start, because I'd made sort of connections working offshore, I started to... Um, to contact uh, operators to see if I could take trips on their platform supply vessels. So essentially the, the, the boats that go out and supply all the materials, equipment, food uh, to the rigs and platforms. And this was actually my first, um, uh, first trip in April, 2018, was actually to where I worked for two years. So this is Central North Sea, this is the Franklin Field. So this is a different drilling rig, but very similar to the one I was on. And it's attached to the, the Franklin platform, which is where I worked. So it felt really, it felt a bit surreal, you know, just having looked, spent two years looking from one perspective to just move from, uh, from looking at a completely different perspective. I've got a little kind of video piece here that I also took because the first day we went out there, there was this, it was so calm, but it was incredible sort of thick fog. And, and um, I love doing these little video sequences and adding music. So I'll just play this.
Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm just, I'm very conscious of time. So um, I'll just try and move through these quite quickly. So, um, so of course that aspect of the work was of real interest to me. I was heavily inspired by the photographers, Bert and Hilla Becker and how they were sort of conceptual artists that documented heavy industry from the, the 60s um, through to the early 2000s. And they would photograph, you know, um, all these uh, different bits of, sort of heavy industry, like gas holders, all from exactly the same perspective and presented these as sort of in, in this sort of typology sort of grid. And I was really sort of influenced that with how I would be a, approaching photographing the rigs and platforms. But while I was on the platforms of live vessels, I was always very, I was also very interested in the people that work there because um, uh, they work in pretty wild sort of conditions at time, and they're often away for sort of five weeks, six weeks at a time. Sometimes the Filipino crew would be away for maybe nine nine uh, sort of uh, I think nine weeks at a time, sometimes longer. Um, so I was I was interested in sort of looking at things from their sort of perspective as well. Dunbar plot platforms. So again, I was fortunate enough to be able to sort of move around in sort of different areas, and that's what was interesting when I go out on the platform supply ves vessels. There is constantly moving, you know, and and. Um, and it's really sort of there's something almost kind of meditative meditative about it as well. I, I I'm often sort of positioned on the bridge, got a 365 degree view, and just you know often it can be many many hours to get out to platforms, particularly in the northern North Sea. You're maybe looking at sort of 24 hours of just traveling to to get there. So this work um, is still continuing, thank thankfully. That I had to, um, uh, I, I spent a couple of a couple of years sort of going out on the vessels, and then obviously I had a lot planned in the eastern summer of of twenty twenty, and then COVID hit. So of course um, uh, that really sort of put, uh, 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 that that really kind of shelved that part of the project for me because. Um, there was no way I would get the, the opportunity to go out on the vessels um, during that time. It was just really, really difficult. So, so what I did was um, I. So yeah, so I should just say so. So as you can see, I'm sort of photographing these all from all in similar sort of lighting conditions, all from the same perspective. And thankfully, I mean, sometimes I go to these places and it'd be bright, sort of nice, lovely kind of weather, lovely sunshine, but it just wouldn't fit into what I was trying to communicate with the work. So, but there'd be shots that I would take digitally for, for the operators because they were allowing me to do, to do this. And I thought, well, if I take shots that they might use for their own sort of marketing, then that's, that's absolutely fine. Um, and uh, this was the... Uh, this was in the 40s field, which is really where North Sea oil and gas sort of production really began. Um, and I was fortunate enough to, to, to go out there. And this is actually in the platform that I worked on, the Britannia platform. This is actually a, a shot taken um, over to looking towards where the 40s field are. There's like Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo. There's five, uh, five platforms uh, out there. So again, it's for, what I'm also trying to communicate is that sort of almost kind of surreal sort of impact, that collision really between the sort of industry and the kind of, you know, the nature and uh, this great expanse of sort of sea as well. And also getting this kind of sense of, you know, how the impact that sort of forty years being out in the in the in the sort of wilds of the North Sea can have in these sort of platforms, and of course these are things that are just part of people's kind of imagination as well, because you know the the they're always sort of over the horizon. <laughs> and just to give you a sense of scale and perspective, the median line that separates 
the UK North Sea from the uh, Norwegian North Sea is 200 miles east from the from Scotland. Yeah, and this was summer, so um, this was really interesting because, uh, you know, this was an, actually in the northern North Sea early July, and it was so calm, the conditions, and actually the crew... Uh, the crew were out playing basketball on the deck of the of the vessel. It was so calm, but it was brilliant. It made for for great images. But I just thought it was again that sort of weird sort of relationship between downtime for the workers and then going past these sort of gigantic, huge kind of monolithic type structures. Jigsaws, jigsaws. They're like captains seem to really enjoy making jigsaws. You go on a platform supply vessel and it's like. Lots of sort of jigsaws framed hanging on the walls, because <laughs> just obviously to pass the time. And again, just that sort of uh, you know the sort of red light that they use in, on the on the bridge in the evenings. It's great. I won't play that video because again, I'm just a wee bit conscious of time. It's just actually I'll, I'll do very quickly just a wee section. This was just. Mm -hmm just a little video that I took of this seal out in the middle of the North Sea and, and this seal was just coming up to the to the edge of the bowl. I think it was definitely getting me confused with a sort of fisherman. <laughs> so anyway, so during lockdown, what I did start to to work on was um, the the uh, fortunately the the decommissioning and onshore dismantling of the platforms. Um, and this had been going on. The, the, obviously, the plans had been in place since the early two thousands. Um, this was then in Teesside, one of the main areas where they started doing the uh, disma onshore dismantling. This is the Brent Alpha platform, which I happen to also have photographed out at sea. So, um, so I started covering this. So uh, Teesside was one of the, the main areas. And what was really interesting about, um, about the locations where they're doing the, 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 the onshore dismantling is that these are places that uh, yards that would have been responsible for the development of the installations, jackets, back in the sort of seventies and early eighties, and almost like we've come full circle now, where where um, platforms are being sort of decommissioned, dismantled simultaneously, while um, we're getting the fabrication of offshore um, wind towers which is what you see here. So really sort of interesting how there's almost this kind of race to try and get um, as much kind of um, support to um, to allow this work, this uh, this new sort of strand of the, the, the industry to exist around our shores. And one of the other sites as well where, where this was happening was in the Shetland Islands. So this was the first... A platform to come uh, ashore in Scotland. Um, this was the Ninian Northern platform, which was just in the northern North Sea, just south of the Brent Field. Um, and this was a big deal for Shetland, so um, and for Scotland really. So, um, so I started. It was interesting because. So I would I I'd sort of started going to these sort of locations, Teesside and up in Shetland. You know, and I sort of wanted to cover this sort of gradual dismantling process. Um, and I actually found a lot of resistance. So the people, I, I found it harder to sort of get access to these environments than actually offshore, ironically, you know. So, um, but anyway, so I, I sort of would go over like uh, to, to Shetland, I think during the time, I think it was maybe a year and a half, it was... It was gradually sort of dismantled, and and I maybe took uh, half a dozen trips um, while I was there, just sort of focusing on 
this uh, sort of burgeoning end of life stage for um, oil and gas installations. And they claim that uh, what they would be doing is sort of recycling about 97% of the uh, of all the sort of materials from uh, uh, from these installations. So really kind of big, big, big business. And uh, so following the uh, Nini Northern platform topside, this was the jacket, the steel jacket that they also uh, brought uh, on shore to dismantle. And of course, what was really interesting about this was that I sort of went up there on a, a time when um, I managed to get a weekend where there was no one working on the site. So I started taking a series of photographs close up and it was so fascinating because, um, you know, after you would have a sort of 20 meter section, which would be the section that would be above water that was all oxidized. And then from about 20 meters down to about 60 meters, every steel beam was encrusted with these muscles. Really interesting. Um, and all this kind of marine life, um, uh, brittle starfish, and actually further down, uh, you had these rare corals as well. So actually scientists sort of ended up going up there and investigating this and sort of thinking, really, what should we be doing with this? You know, should we be, should be leaving some of these sort of structures in the water as marine habitats? Over in the Gulf of Mexico, they're, they're, they're doing this uh, scheme, which is uh, rigs to reefs, I think it's called. So they do actually have sort of art, these artificial habitats that are still there. Um, but there's a lot of debates, obviously a lot of debate, debate, some of the concrete gravity structures that are still out in the water have thousands of tonnes of oily sort of sediment in the cells at the bottom. And I mean, what, you know, who's going to look after them for the next 100, 200 years? So there's a lot of interest in sort of debates about, about that. So. Uh, so one other area that I've been I've been sort of going to is over in uh, Norway um, in Vats, which is the sort of southwest uh, um, of Norway, where they that they at the start of the year started uh, dismantling the um, Shell Curlew FBSO, which is the largest production vessel ever to be brought onto land for dismantling. So um, so I, I actually managed to get, I had to go to Norway to get access to these sites, ironically, uh, but they've been great. And um, so I've been going, I went back there to the start of summer as well. Um, and I'm planning to, to go back over in, in a, a couple of uh, months time. And this is just one of the, so that the FPSO being a floating production storage and offloading vessel, this would be one of the, one of the tanks that they would be storing this, the oil in. And that's it. That's us. Thank you. <laughs>